Hey, what's going on everyone? Meteorologist Mike Linden back again with a really special interview. Of course, we, well within the world of meteorology and climatology, there is a ton of science that goes into that, but even beyond and expanding upon the science is AI and machine learning. And we are so excited to be partnered with the NSF AI Institute for research on trustworthy AI in weather, climate, and coastal oceanography. And for that, we welcome in Dr. Amy McGovern. Amy, we're so excited to have you and speak with you regarding AI and machine learning. It's something that, of course, within my radar, we are really interested in. Of course, you are really interested in that as well. We're really excited to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Yes. So we wanted to talk to you, of course, a bit more about the Institute. Can you explain what, I know it's a mouthful, it's got, it's a long title. Can you explain what the NSF AI Institute on, for, for research on trustworthy AI and weather, climate, no coastal, coastal oceanography. Explain it to us what it is. Sure, and then I would give the short name too because the shorter name's a whole lot easier to remember. The AI2ES just means AI for environmental science. The two is actually a math joke that's hidden in there, but just ignore that part. So it's just AI egg. applied. Yes, it's an Easter egg. So it's AI applied to a variety of environmental science applications. That's the short version of our name. What we are, we are a NSF AI Institute, we were funded in the first year of NSF's new investments into AI and trying to transform AI and its applications across a wide variety of applications across the whole United States. We were one of the first ones that were funded. So we were funded in 2020. Um, we're, as far as I know, the only one working on weather and climate. Um, but our goal is, so we have $20 million from NSF spread over five years and then spread over a whole bunch of institutions. And the goal is to develop AI that will be trustworthy. And by that, we mean that the users are actually going to trust it. They're going to actually use it, in, especially in decisions like life or death decisions, like weather forecasters have to make. That, so we're developing trustworthy AI and defining what it means to be trustworthy, understanding why our users think it's trustworthy for a huge variety of both weather and climate and coastal oceanography applications. I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I was curious about that. The, the name tr or the word trustworthy is in the name. So of course, gaining you know trust o over something empirical and scientific is, is fairly important. Why is it important when it is uh, related to AI and machine learning? Being that that's somewhat of a new field as we go forward into the future here, why is it important for you to gain the trust of those forecasters and for the general public? I think if we're going to use the AI and we're going to if we're going to create a method that the goal is to help the forecasters, help the emergency managers, help the general public, help them to make better decisions, both about weather and climate, we really want them to trust what they're getting. And we really want on our end to understand what it means that they would trust it. So weather forecasters right now already know that there's really no perfect model out there. Um, and we want to be able to develop, we're not trying to develop the perfect model because I'm not sure that there is a perfect weather model out there right now, but we're trying to improve upon it. And one way that that might be trusted, for example, is they know, well, they can rely on this model under this situation. So for example, one of our example applications we're looking at is predicting freezing rain, which is a huge impactful event when, you know, it's and it's very, very hard to predict because it's the difference in one degree in temperature, 33 versus 32. And if you know that the AI model is very, very good at what it's doing and it's going to give you, you know, an answer that you trust, then you're more likely to be able to make better decisions to be able to better inform the public about what's going on than if you already know that this other model gets it wrong a bunch of the time. So it's a reason that we, we care about the trust, for example. We also just don't want them making decisions off of something that isn't good. <laughs> Right. Do you think that there's a preconceived notion toward AI and machine learning from the general public that it's, you know, quote unquote, a bad thing that we're entrusting the the, the robots, if for lack of a better term? I think Hollywood has made it kind of that way. <laughs> um, I'm actually giving a talk this week as well to the general public about that. And Hollywood tends to portray AI as though it's the robots all coming to kill us, but that's not actually what's going to happen. Um, I, I would hope that what's going on is that the general public actually is using AI all the time without really realizing it. Everybody who has a smartphone has AI on their smartphone and they just don't know it. You talk to Siri, you talk to um, you know, your Google assistant, you talk to it, your Amazon assistant, whatever assistant you have, you're talking to it and it's using AI in the background. Um, you're getting directions on your maps to go anywhere. They're using AI. And the general public is already trusting them. In fact, so much that sometimes they do the wrong thing. You read stories occasionally in the news about people who trusted their map so much they drove into a river because they didn't tell them that they were supposed to get on a ferry. Um, that's another reason we care about trustworthy, right? We'd like it to communicate right. everything. But, 
But I think that the general public, I don't know that they necessarily have a preconceived notion other than what they've seen in the movies. And then the only other bad thing that they tend to see is in the news. You don't tend to see AI saves 10 million lives. No, instead you see AI did this thing wrong. That's what shows up in the news. I'm hoping we can get past that. I'm hoping part of this video series is part of that, that we can show people that AI can save lots of lives, can make mm -hmm. you make better decisions. And uh, to kind of piggyback off of that machine learning, can, can you break down what that is and how it relates to AI? Yes. So AI is a, a superset, really. AI involves methods that do not adapt. Machine learning is really an attempt to do adaptive methods. So more like the humans are, are doing learning, right? If you gave a human an answer, if you, I don't know, let's pick an example, like a multiplication table. You ask them to learn their multiplication table, all they're doing is memorizing. But if you ask them to learn to generalize, to do more interesting things, you know, and teach them how to actually do multiplication, they've done something they've learned, they can solve problems they've never seen before. And that's part of adapting. Machine learning is adapting to unseen situations. And AI methods, machine learning is part of AI, but there are AI methods out there that don't involve adaptation, where they just are search, just pure search. G generally, Google Maps is probably the easiest answer to do that that the public's familiar with. If I ask it to go from point A to point B, it's going to give you the same answer every single time, unless, of course, a road closes or something. But assuming the conditions are the same, it's going to give you the same answer. There's no real adaptation in there. So can you break down what the scope of your research is with the Institute? Yes. So we're developing the trustworthy AI, like I mentioned. Um, we are doing that by working together with meteorologists and climatologists and then with risk communication or social scientists. Um, and together, what we're doing is we're working on, we have five different application areas, and we are developing the AI hand in hand with our, our atmospheric scientists and our ocean all, or the people who are doing coastal oceanography, and then with the social scientists who are actually checking with our end users to see something, why something might be trustworthy and why it might not be trustworthy so that we can adapt the methods as we need. So the five application areas we're working on are convective weather, so lightning, hail, tornadoes, wind, anything that comes with a thunderstorm. Um, uh, hurricanes, also known as tropical cyclones. Um, winter weather, I mentioned that one already. So freezing rain, looking at some visibility prediction, looking at snowfall prediction. Um, Subseasonal to seasonal prediction, um, and in particular trying to look at extreme events in the subseasonal range. So that's basically like three to four weeks in advance, looking at things like those atmospheric rivers that come in and hit the west coast of the United States. Um, and then the final one is coastal oceanography. Um, the public tends to get pretty excited about this when I start talking about it because we're trying to save the sea turtles as one of our examples. Um, we're also looking at uh, coastal inundation where the, the beaches are sort of washing away from the, the sea level rise um, and harmful algal blooms as well as uh, some some other things out or in, out in the, the deeper ocean and in the Gulf of Mexico, looking at circulations in the Gulf of Mexico as well. Yeah, I think you're going to have everybody on your team when you're trying to save the sea turtles. Everybody. Yes. Everybody. Yes. <laughs> so, so now, other than, of course, the sea turtles being adorable and everybody, of course, wants to, to protect them. Why did you guys hone in on coastal oceanography? It was part of we were trying to develop something that was a very broad set of applications. And we were going beyond just the atmosphere. Right. And the ocean is mm -hmm. something that's part of the atmosphere. And we care deeply about it. And we had colleagues who were already working in it. And we made a really good team. So I don't personally do the oceanography stuff. I just get excited about it, especially the turtles. Um, but you know the why, because we really want to show that we can do AI. My overarching goal is to develop AI that will make humanity better able to withstand climate change, more resilient to the climate change. And that means we need to care about the ocean because it isn't of, just caring about the land. Of course, totally agree. So who are the folks that make up AI2ES, of course, it's it's not just yourself. You're leading up uh, that portion of the Institute. Who else makes up the Institute? Um, I should change my background to the set of all of our logos. Um, <laughs> but we are we are led by the University of Oklahoma, which is where I'm a professor. Um, and then we have Texas A&M Corpus Christi, and they lead the coastal part of the coastal oceanography. They're the ones who lead the sea turtles. Colorado State University, um, who's helping develop um, trust, well, everybody's helping develop trust for the AI, so I'll just talk about the application areas. Um, Colorado State University is working on um, the uh, tropical cyclones, hurricanes. Um, North Carolina State U University, they're working on the other coastal oceanography applications, the um, the deep sea, the harmful algal blooms, and then the um, rotations out, the called ocean eddies in the Gulf of Mexico. University at Albany, they're leading the winter weather part. University of Washington, 
Um, they're working on the risk communication and Central Michigan University is a recent partner. They're working on the convective weather along with OU. And then we have a partner, I didn't, you didn't ask about this part yet, but it's something that we deeply care about. Um, Del Mar College, um, who is a community college and they're developing an AI certificate. We're trying to also improve and broaden the participation and broaden the ability for people who are in the existing workforce to learn about AI for the environmental sciences. And that's what Del Mar College is doing. They developed one of the first AI certificates in the nation at the community college level. Now, has this, has AI and machine learning, of course, has kind of been the backbone of weather models, as you touched on, but where do you hope to see, as you mentioned, you have the funding over the next several years, where do you hope that as a whole the field goes with the research that you and the folks within AI2ES are going to contribute to? Where, where is it going over the next 5, 10, 20 years? I don't have funding for 20 years, but I do hope to get there someday. <laughs> um, over the, the years of the grant, we're going to be developing, well, you're asking kind of the, the five-year goal of the grant, like what are we doing? We're, we're developing AI, that, developing and testing and being able to say exactly what means AI means to be trustworthy, right? So we're in, in addition to all the academic partners that you ask about, um, I, I didn't list all of the private industry partners. And then we have a couple of government partners. We're working with NOAA, for example, and we just added a collaboration with NIST, which is the National Institutes of Standard and Technology. So we're helping to develop some of the standards for what it means to be trustworthy AI. So at the end of our five years, um, I would hope that we have developed some of those standards. We understand what it means to be trustworthy and that we have deployed some of this and really made a difference so that we can change the predictions of those things I was talking about. That we have better winter weather predictions. We have better tornado predictions. We have better tropical cyclone slash hurricane pred predictions. We've saved more sea turtles, et cetera. Yes. So as <laughs> you progress over the next five years here, when, when you arrive at that end, at, at what point can you then work toward getting additional funding. It, I would imagine that that's the goal, to continue to prove uh, that this research yes. is necessary. And then, of course, to continue on from and there. And to expand the applications. We want to expand the applications, right? I mean, one of the things we've been applying for funding right now is on wildfires. We, would, we think that wildfires will be a great addition to what we're doing. And they're something that's tremendously impacting the United States right now. And we think we could use a, develop AI methods that could, that could be used to save lives. Um, certainly. So we're looking for funding all along is the answer to that. Um, we don't know what NSF situation will be, uh, yet, but there, the hope is that there will be additional funding available from NSF as well as some of the other federal agencies. Um, I also have a dream of making a cross-agency center that would be AI for climate resiliency that would really apply to a huge variety of application areas. I'm still working on achieving that great dream and convincing the agencies to actually talk to each other. Well, we are so excited to continue uh, speaking with you and, of course, everybody involved in AI2ES. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you, of course, being that we are huge proponents of STEM here, of, I, of course, I know that you are as well. For, for somebody that might be listening or watching this conversation, how could they potentially get involved with what you are doing with your research? And I guess for, for, for younger students that are getting involved with STEM, what, what is the path forward here for AI and machine learning with what you guys are, how you are applying it again within weather, climatology, and coastal oceanography? That's an excellent set of questions. Um, I will answer, <laughs> there's actually several questions in there. Let's make sure I get them all answered. For the younger sure. students, especially if you're in, let's see, if you're already in college, um, we have a program that we're, we're working with at REU, which stands for Research Experiences for Undergraduates. And so every summer we take in a number of undergraduate students and we train them up on AI for weather applications. Um, our students are just graduating this week. I don't know when this will air, but they're just graduating at the end of the end of July. Congratulations. Um, so it's a, thank you. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of fun, but that's certainly a good thing for undergraduates. If you're thinking even younger, the talk that I'm giving later this week is actually to a group of teachers who are working on getting their certification from AMS, which is the American Meteorological Society. And they're working on getting certified to teach atmospheric topics. And I'm gonna teach them about AI for atmosphere. Now, of course, I'm only one piece of an entire week long course, but I'm hoping to get sort of the message out there to the K-12 audience that AI could be used. And then beyond that, so I'm trying to make sure I'm answering all of your questions. We are trying to actually tackle all of that, right? There's the AI certificate that I mentioned. We're also, we've been running summer schools for the last two, three summers, really, two summers of our existence. And then um, there's another summer school that was run prior to that, but it's the same people. It was just sponsored by a slightly different uh, group. We're, we've been running the summer schools. All of the stuff is online right now. And what we're planning to do next summer is actually sort of do a virtual meta summer school where we're gonna put all of those resources together into a way that it's a class that you could take online 
um, that you could learn more about AI for the environmental sciences. And then you can jump into, oh, I want to learn about this topic specifically. And you can sort of jump down that thread. Um, we're working on how we're going to put that together. Yeah. And that'll be available to anybody. I mean, general public could take it. The intent is really aimed at workforce retraining. But, um, you know, so anybody who's already sort of got an undergraduate degree, but there'll be parts that'll be available for the general public as well. So now hypothetical here, let's just say you have an unlimited budget. Where would where, <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> where, <laughs> where would you spend that money in, again, furthering your research in AI and machine learning with, of course, the topics that you are researching? Hiring more postdocs and research scientists <laughs> so that we could get a lot done. And, and then if you want to ask which ones, I would, I would add, I want AI, I want uh, meteorology, you know, people doing coastal oceanography. Um, and then I also want social scientists. Our social science team is particularly stretched thin, right? When, when I emphasize the key of trustworthy, it means we're having social scientists involved at every level. And I think we need to add more to our social science team. And then since we're unlimited money and we're dreaming, um, I would like to expand the applications that we're doing. I'm probably jump into the wildfires first because it's a big application area, but there's a whole right. bunch more we could do beyond that. Well, Amy, we are so excited to continue to speak with you. And of course, the folks within AI2ES will have more information for those of you watching on YouTube, in the app, or wherever you're watching. We'll have more information in the description box below with tons of information to link you right to AI2ES. But Amy, is there anything else that you'd like to mention that we might not necessarily have touched on or where people can go to learn more information? Um, well, you can go to our website, which I think I'm wearing, AI2ES.org. <laughs> there it is. Um, and... Uh, you can put that in your information that you're going to link. And then AI2ES.org, I believe it's slash education. We'll have all of our links for our education information. That's already all there, although that class I talked about, the sort of meta class, isn't there yet. Mm -hmm. um, but all the other links are already there. There's a bunch of short courses and everything there as well. Fantastic. Well, again, we are so thankful that we are a part of this partnership and speak with you guys and very excited to see the videos that we produce beyond this one. Of course, the, the sea turtles, I'm looking forward to a big deal. Um, I would imagine that uh, a lot of people are going to be really excited to hear about how you guys are helping uh, to, to save them. So again, thank you so much for speaking with us. We look forward to speaking with more folks such as yourself within AI2ES. But again, if you're looking to learn more about AI2ES, head to that description box down below. For Dr. McGovern, I've been meeting Meteorologist Mike Linden. Thanks a bunch, everyone. We'll see you back here soon. See ya. Thank you. Follow My Radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.